I'm Stephanie Hafferty and I'm a no-dig gardener. And I've been growing really since my teens, but that was mostly to grow things to make wine with. And I dabbled, I grew the odd thing like herbs until about 27, 28 years ago when I started growing my first at-home gardens. And I've been growing as a no-dig gardener for 13 years now. And that has also been my job. So as well as growing at home, I was growing on market gardens, on private estates. I ran kitchen gardens for clients. So it's been quite a varied uh, career in gardening. So I moved from Somerset, from Bruton in Somerset, here uh, five months ago. And when I arrived here, it was this area where I'm sitting now was completely grass, weedy grass. It's got creeping buttercup in and clover and dandelions and things like that. And uh, there's various other bits to the garden as well, different beds and an orchard behind me which again, it, the flower beds had things in, but they were fairly neglected and everywhere else was grass. And I started this on March the 31st by making the first bed over there. I did this a bed at a time, which was mainly for practical reasons because I was mulching with cardboard. So I needed to unpack first to get the cardboard to make the bed. And I, uh, I think keep things simple and manageable. So these were made by putting cardboard down on the weedy grass, which was mown first, and then five centimetres of compost on top with uh, wood chip for the paths. And that is using less compost and it helps kill the grass underneath and you can start growing straight away. But you just do an area that you can manage and then do the next bit. You don't have to feel that you need to set up the whole garden immediately because I think that way you'd, it would just get too stressful. In my previous garden, I would put one to two centimetres of compost a year on top of the beds. This was all bought in because obviously I moved such a long distance. It would have been impractical to bring all my compost heaps with me. But in future, I plan to make all the compost that I need, that's my mission. In my previous garden, which was smaller than this, I was able to make all the compost that I needed. Whereas here, I've got extra resources that mean I can make more compost, such as I've got areas of grass in the orchard and I've got a lot of leaves, which I'll be able to compost down. The opportunity for making enough compost eventually is here and I'm interested in fermented teas as a way of feeding the soil without having to add any compost and I went to a market garden in Oxfordshire Enzo Farm and there he's using different fermented teas from Korean natural agriculture which is a way of he's exploring using less mulch and using these teas but one of the Criticisms of no dig gardening, which is valid, is how do you make enough compost, particularly for people in smaller gardens? And the reality is, if you're digging, you need compost. You know, it's not an either or. Exploring other forms of fertility, I think, is beneficial and it's actually really good fun too. One of the key ways that I garden is looking at getting a balance between the predators and the prey and working with nature so that things will flourish. And in my previous garden, I was there 20 years, so by the time I left, it was really in balance. And I knew that when I would see aphids in the spring, that I didn't have to think about it at all, because within two weeks, all of the predators were there. That was something that I, I know works really well and obviously there's no way I would use um, herbicides or pesticides. Here it's new and I'm learning constantly about getting the balance right. So I know there are wasps here which is handy because social wasps are phenomenal predators of lots of the bugs that attack the things I want to grow. This time next year there'll be a lot less habitat and hopefully things will be far more in balance. I think what surprised me the most actually is how quickly things got established and started to flourish. And yeah, I think it's just, it actually surprises me every time I walk out of the house that this is here, even though I put it here, which I know sounds a bit mad, but it's like, this isn't a lawn, this is lots of food.
I grow a lot of annual flowers every year and I like to put them in amongst things, partly because it's good for bringing in different kinds of insects, but also I think it's cheerful and I just like it. And it's an awful lot of green when you're growing vegetables and it's nice to have splashes of colour. So some people brought me lovely presents when I moved here, like welcome to Wales presents, like sacks of alpaca poo and sacks of um, pooey sheep's fleece, sheep dags, which I experimented with as mulches. Both of those I'd not used before. And also wood chip. I had to have some trees chopped down because they were dangerous. And so I've got a supply of beech and fir wood chip. I've used cardboard with polythene on top to clear the ground. Some of them I knew would cause slug habitat. That one certainly did. I planted squash in it and they all got eaten. But it's just different ways of trying things out. And the one that has surprised me the most was a kind of little hugelet. So it's kind of hugel culture, but not quite the way it's normally advised to make it. And I know that hugels in this country can be a habitat for vermin and can be a habitat for slugs. But I planted rhubarb in, which not a lot tends to go for. And then we put in squash and tomatoes and um, soya beans and a few other things. And I thought it's all going to get eaten apart from my rhubarb, but at least it's this, it's spare plants. And actually it's been the best squash that I've grown here. So that was an experiment that I wasn't convinced would work and actually it's flourished. I like trying out different things. I have some things that I grow every year such as the czar beans there because I know they work well and I, they're very versatile and they're winter food and they're yummy. Um, I like to grow Grenoble red salad every winter. I've just sown the seeds now for the polytunnel and because I know that works well undercover and it works well outside but every year I do like to try different things. I'm keen to see what has been brought here from other countries as well. There's such a, a wide amount of choice. I've just managed to find some different um, Japanese greens that you can grow over winter that I've never tried before so I'm excited to see those. I do like to support smaller seed companies but also I think from my work as a garden writer I think it's also important to be aware of you know what seeds they're selling in the supermarkets particularly the ones that will do four packets for a pound because back in the day I was um, raising three kids on my own and we were skint and that is how I grew a garden. I could afford to buy four packets for a pound seeds. I have been able to afford to order them online. I don't think anything it's ever a good idea to just stick with a few things. I much prefer variety. I've had one gardening book published which I co-wrote with Charles and that was published in 2017 and the following year I wrote a book called The Creative Kitchen which is about um, recipes which you can grow yourself almost entirely there's a few things in there that you can't like olive oil but everything else could be grown on an allotment in England or Wales and it's all plant-based but it's not a vegan book it's like it just is plant-based because that's what I grow I grow vegetables and fruit and herbs I'm currently writing um, a book about growing year-round in smaller spaces based on my experience of growing at home at allotments and it's a very practical book for people however whatever size situation they've got social media wise i've recently started a youtube channel which is my name and i f publish on instagram updates about the garden pretty much every day really and I do very short videos on there too and that's also my name Stephanie Hafferty so all of my social media is my name which is quite handy really because I don't have to remember anything else. Um, I have a website as well and a blog um, where I update you know fairly regularly and that has lots of information on about what I do. I think one thing that is important is um, I work from home. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the work I did when I was traveling around giving talks has been cancelled because of the pandemic and that isn't unlikely to start properly till next year. So much of what I'm doing is from here, which gives me the flexibility to look at the weather forecast and think, okay, I've got to spend this amount of time writing 
and this is when it's going to be nice weather so that's when I'm going to go and make a new bed or side shoot the tomatoes or whatever the job is. It is beneficial because I'm not having to be somewhere else when the weather's great. I have that flexibility and for a lot of people they wouldn't have that. You know, if you've got to be working in um, an office or in a supermarket or in a, a different location, that is the reality for most people. Even the people working from home, they've got to be there at certain times. They don't have that flexibility. So I think it's important to note that I do have that and that is a great advantage. And um, I don't want it to look like, you know, hey, look, I've done all this, aren't I marvellous? It is also because I can, re I can adjust my day. I do work very long days, but I can adjust what I'm doing to fit around what I'm wanting to make. And that isn't something that is available for everybody. In a couple of years' time, um, I will have more of the orchard mulched and a productive area there and a fruit cage over my soft fruit, which is hopefully happening this winter. I'm going to make it, so I'm hoping it doesn't all fall down. Uh, I will have more soft fruit. I will have more fruit trees and fruit bushes. Um, I will have finally unpacked in a couple of years as well, I'm hoping. I would be hoping that there will be the balance that, I, that one can create between the predators and the pests and everything that I'm growing. I'll certainly know a lot more about growing in this location because at the moment I don't know what the winters are like here. I keep hearing about them, but I will have more um, plants growing for other projects that I like, such as dyeing and as in dyeing clothes. I'm really interested in getting more exploring other ways of gathering water and I will have more of my potions going for the different ferments that I'm wanting to experiment with. I try to be as self-sufficient as possible. That was my goal in where I lived before and it's certainly one of the things I'm looking at doing here. I do a lot of preserving in a normal year. This year I won't be, I've not produced the stuff. Next year I have you know, dehydrators, I have a water bath canner, that kind of thing. I make a lot of wine. So I do like that but I don't want to be self-sufficient kind of closed loop because part of what I want to do is, I, you know, I like seeing people and I think you could end up, there's a bit of a pressure sometimes I think that you, you just keep everything yourself and in your little loop. But I want to be able to go into Lampeter and buy things from small shops. If I don't do that, there won't be small shops. They will, they'll just be supermarkets. And I like the interaction and the chatting. I was joking with a friend the other day that the advantage of me having lost almost all of my squash to slugs is I'm going to have to go and buy squash this winter. And, you know, when you work from home, it can be, you can just be happy in your own little bubble. It will make me go out and chat with other people. And that's important. It's important to interact. I think one of the things we've learned as well in the pandemic with a lot of isolation is how important human interaction is. And I don't think there should be a pressure. Sometimes it's um, people, you know, I've been criticised for buying in compost because I didn't make it, even though it wouldn't have been humanly possible. You know, nothing in life is perfect. And I don't think being closed loop, entirely self-sufficient is possible for most people. I need to run a car, can't make my own petrol. Or is it necessarily a healthy thing socially? Maybe that's just me because I like talking, I don't know. <laughs>